Our last speaker before the poster session uh, will be Kevin Hayes. Um, he will talk about the chemical characterization of the aircraft cabin environment utilizing GCGC TAF MS and hard and soft ionization. Hi, thank you for that uh, introduction. Yes, my name is Kevin Hayes. I am a PhD student at Manchester Metropolitan University, although I do most of my work at Mount Royal University in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Um, as mentioned, we like to look at uh, the chemical character characterization of the aircraft cabin, um, and we like to use GCGC to do so. Um, Let's take a look at some of our stuff. First, I'd like to give a little bit of background. Uh, when we talk about aircraft pressurization, uh, we all recognize that aircraft has to be pressurized, otherwise we'd all be sleeping much better on all our flights at altitude. <laughs> so we definitely need to have uh, the cabin being pressurized. And how the vast majority of aircraft that are out there do this is they bleed air from the compression section of their engines. So if you look up here, this green section that's at the front, they're drawing in a huge amount of air. Um, a portion of that air is bled uh, into the pneumatic system of the aircraft, and that air is then brought into the cabin. Um, this is done in an unfiltered manner, um, but it does allow for the air to overturn in the aircraft pretty regularly. Like um, typically, air would be basically brand new in your air airplane every two to three minutes. Okay, uh, so it's not sealed. There is one aircraft that does not use this type of pressurization at the moment. That's the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. Many of you may have flown on this. Uh, it's electronically compressed, so it doesn't use this exact type of uh, system. Okay. Along with uh, using this bleed air to pressurize the cabin comes a potential a potential issue, and that's contamination of the pneumatic system by things like the engine oil or hydraulic fluid. Basically, anything that's connected to the pneumatic system can make its way potentially into the aircraft. This image that you see up here on the top right, I guess for you, is an example of a fume event. So this picture is from an actual flight. This flight was going from Arizona to Maui, Hawaii. Um, and what you see is kind of a fine mist of oil that has made its way into the aircraft cabin. This is usually due to something like a broken seal or something in the engine that allows for this oil to leak out. But this is not the only circumstance that uh, this can happen. Okay, You don't necessarily have to have this big mass leakage event to get contamination of the airplane cabin because that contamination pathway is extant whether you have the big leak or not. Okay, a huge number of the components that are within the engine are designed to leak at relatively low levels. You're, it's like okay from an engineering standpoint to have a little bit of oil attrition as opposed to have say like a bearing seized during flight, which is something that nobody wants, right? So you're gonna wanna see you get some oil attrition. Inside this oil, because it has to deal with such high pressure, because it has to deal with such high temperatures, there's a bunch of additives, okay? Some of those additives, like phosphates, are neurotoxic, which is potentially problematic if you've got huge amounts of this stuff entering the cabin, and potentially problematic from a chronic low-dose exposure if you happen to fly very regularly or you're a pilot or you're a flight attendant. Okay, so this is a problem that's been recognized over time. We've noticed some human health implications, um, not myself, but people in general. So this started off basically in the late 90s with uh, Winder and Balouette, and they basically coined the term aerotoxic syndrome. They noticed that there's some kind of occupational neurological illness associated, potentially associated with flight. Moving forward a number of years, we started to see some actual hard data coming out where people have taken a look at pilots and flight attendants. Um, this is a Renneman study from 2015. They noticed white matter uh, problems and blood flow perfusion problems within the brains of pilots and flight attendants that have been complaining of illness. Then a very recent study, a relatively recent study, this is a large scale cohort study done of 1.1 million uh, United States veterans um, in various military branches looking for a neurological illness or disease that mimics or is ALS, found that there was a huge uptick of this kind of neurological injury in one particular branch of the, uh, one particular branch of the armed forces, and that happened to be the Air Force. 
They, so when they looked at it, they thought that, okay, we might need to look at some environmental causes, some occupational exposures that could be explaining some of this. Okay, so in terms of our study, uh, we wanted to look at the aircraft cabin and we wanted to look at it in a more holistic way. So previously, those organic phosphates have really been looked at in a targeted manner. We thought that uh, it was overdue for the aircraft cabin to get uh, a bit of non-targeted or a pseudo non-targeted kind of look, I guess you'd say. Uh, another thing that we wanted to do is we have that bleed free aircraft, that Boeing 787 and all the other aircraft that are bleed air pressurized. We wanted to make a direct comparison across those two to see how much stuff is really coming from these bleed air systems and how much is potentially just in the aircraft environment itself, like not necessarily unique to aircraft, but maybe just part of flying. Okay, so in our study, uh, we used a citizen science initiative. It allowed us to collect a huge number of samples. Uh, sampling flights individually in person would have been very expensive. Um, also, I don't like to fly, so it would have been my nightmare. Um, so, but at any rate, that was kind of the, we went citizen science initiative. We got a bunch of people together. They collected a huge number of stuff, uh, samples for us. So from 62 unique aircraft. <clears throat> okay, uh, instrumental analysis. We used GC by GC time of flight mass spec. Um, and we did so in tandem ionization mode or concurrent tandem ionization mode. <clears throat> Pardon me, sorry. Why we wanted to use GCGC -GC, um, was for a number of reasons. We really wanted the higher peak resolution. We wanted to be able to see more than what was uh, potentially in what we could see in a GCMS sample. Uh, but the other reason was because we were doing a citizen science initiative, we had to use commercially available prepackaged wipes that would be allowed to go on airplanes uh, in order to do our wipe sampling and would be allowed to be mailed through the mail back to us. <clears throat> that required us to select uh, a wipe it's a BD alcohol wipe. It's like something that uh, if you've ever gone to the doctor and had an injection or something, they wipe on your skin. It's isopropyl, 70%. But what those wipes have is a huge amount of background. Uh, you might want to think about that next time you're at the doctor getting the wipe first. So this is an example of a wipe blank, actually, uh, that you can see there. So we really needed all that uh, chromatographic space, you could say, uh, to do uh, some of the work. Okay, uh, tandem ionization was done because we wanted all the fragmentation that was associated with 70 EV or hard ionization, but also because this was non-targeted, uh, catching that molecular ion was a really big deal for us. We really wanted to uh, see if we could find it so that we could hopefully uh, get a better picture or a better idea of some of our stuff. Okay, its parameters are pretty standard for a flow modulated uh, GC, modulator four seconds. Um, uh, every trip length, oh, sorry, I should say every sample has a match trip length. So every sample, every trip length, every other blank was injected in triplicate. Uh, this was primarily to do artifact removal. Uh, instrument drift was monitored using deuterated covet sleeve retention indices. A mix that was injected daily. Um, as far as data processing, uh, we chose parameters to basically get uh, the ideal number of peaks, hopefully uh, while avoiding identifying absent peaks or artifacts. This was done with a huge amount of help from the people at SpectralWorks. Uh, so thank you so much to John and Scott at SpectralWorks for that. Uh, one really important consideration that we found when we were processing this data is that uh, when we're looking at the number of masses for peak ID, you have to be fairly careful, especially if you're going to be processing your, um, your soft ionization and your hard ionization with the same processing method. So if you decide that you're going to use the same processing method, uh, set your mass IDs low uh, because you just won't see those masses in your low uh, or your soft ionization. So it's just something to consider anyway. Um, how Analyzer Pro XD works, this is our slides from Analyzer Pro. Uh, I can't tell you exactly, I can tell you that it works uh, very well and it's quite quick to process the data. Uh, from my understanding, it takes uh, your data, puts it into 1D chromatograms, basically your GCGC -GC data and then combines them after the fact. Uh, Scott Campbell sitting here, he would uh, probably be the person to look at to help you out with that after the fact. 
Um, and then other things, sorry, uh, that go on with, they have a really good statistical package, especially when we're trying to compare against things uh, like one thing against another. So for us, we're going to be comparing our bleed-free aircraft against a variety of different uh, bleed air aircraft. Oh, in terms of bleed versus non-bleed, these are our actual aircraft samples. Um, keep in mind, these are all our bleed-free aircraft versus all of the aircraft that we've collected of various classes, okay? So at the top here, we have our Boeing 787. That's all on this side. And on the this side is our bleed air aircraft. Okay, so at the top, it's 787 versus our 737-600 series. Um, at the bottom is 787 versus the A321 series in terms of things. So when you look at these pictures, you'll note that on the bleed air side or the side that's pressurized with bleed air, we see more compounds that are statistically significant that are higher in our bleed air aircraft. And we also see more that are unique in our bleed air pressurized aircraft as compared to our bleed free stuff. Okay. Uh, the same is true when we look at other classes. So we've got the A319 or A319, A330 series aircraft. These are also showing more in terms of higher uh, concentrations within those aircraft, although not more in terms of the unique um, that are statistically relevant. So it's something interesting to look at. It's something that gave us uh, motivation to keep pushing through. There definitely seems to be some kind of connection with bleed air pressurization and uh, more compounds in the, in the aircraft. Okay, so that led us to creating a database. Uh, this is a way that I really like to work with uh, this kind of data. Um, I prefer to use Microsoft Access, although any database would likely work. Basically, you can take your peak tables, uh, pull them out of uh, your whatever software you're using, throw them into a database, and then you have all the functionality of a database for going through and kind of sorting the things you want. Additionally, you can uh, do queries. So you can program your own queries so you can independently look at your data, however you'd really like to do it. Um, Access works in SQL, so if you happen to be able to write in SQL, that's fantastic. If you're not able to write in SQL, uh, which I am not, ChatGPT does an excellent job of doing uh, basically that exact thing. So these are a number of queries that we did. So we did some match data stuff. So basically what you can do is set peak specific retention time windows. Um, and when you set your peak specific retention time windows, you can have as many other criteria amended to that as possible. Like, so you could say peak specific retention time window plus your base peak plus any qualifying ions that you want to have and make sure that those things match up between your samples. Okay, so uh, you can set ranges of error. You can do basically whatever you want. You have a bunch of work. So with that, we looked at match data. So this is where we're looking at things that had 10 times the peak area in our uh, samples as opposed to our trip lengths. We look for things that were unique in our trip lengths or unique in our samples as compared to our trip lengths. We look for things that were only present in bleed air aircraft. We did a bunch of different things. Um, and you can kind of do that <coughs> however you'd like. So in terms of, I'm just gonna do a, a little very brief kind of thing here. In terms of compounds that are present in, present, sorry, in both samples and trip lengths, we have uh, decanol, uh, or well, we have a bunch of stuff, but decanol is the one that I'm going to focus on. Um, <clears throat> uh, basically, we see it in our sample, we see it in our trip length, but we see it in our sample on average like 17.8 times more in terms of our prevalence. This makes sense um, from, if we have the background research, like decanol is a byproduct of Jet 1A combustion, so you're kind of expecting to see this as aircraft exhaust you're probably gonna be picking it up. We picked it up only in our bleed air aircraft, which doesn't make a huge amount of sense because we probably should have picked it up in both in the sense that even if your aircraft is being electronically compressed, you're still pulling in outside air. So you'd expect to see it in both. So maybe this has something to do with the engines. We're, we're really not sure. We're also not able to absolutely confirm this presence at this point, like we'd have to inject with standards. Um, but we do see some, uh, I guess, good things coming out or, or evidence supporting it with our mass spectral or our molecular ion peaks, sorry, in the mass spectra when we switch to 16 EB. Okay, 
compounds present in a sample but not in a TP or in triplanks. Um, this is just an example here. So if you see these two peaks down here at the bottom, we have two peaks that kind of show up that are not present in triplank. Triplank is up at the top. Um, they're, they're pretty big. They're ugly looking peaks. And uh, we were kind of wondering what, what could these potentially be? Um, they were found to be unique to the triplanks. You see here, we have a little bit of chrom better chromatography in these samples, um, but still uh, not entirely certain. And something was kind of interesting in that these two peaks here and here, they're basically the same. They're being identified library match as the exact same compound. Uh, and why they're being identified as the exact same compound is because they share the same base peak, they share the same secondary peak, but um, pretty, pretty sure that it's not um, this amino isophosphine, you know what I mean? Certainly not in both places. Um, so what we're able to do because we were in tandem ionization is dive into 16 EV and try and figure out if we've got more molecular ion. So we're looking for 189, which is the molecular ion mass of this compound. We're seeing nothing. Okay? We're finding it maybe a tiny bit in the raw spectra, but like nothing um, really useful. But what we do see is an increase in 241. Okay, so... 241, when we look in the 16 EV, is doubling or tripling in size across samples where it's detected as opposed to this 189 that's supposed to be present, um, which is uh, good news for us because it means that, okay, maybe we're finding something that is actually present or we're finding some, like, some of the molecular ion. At the very least, it allows us to discard that previous compound ID so we can say this is not what's here, and now maybe this is what's here. So we find this at that 22 minute peak. We have the same kind of stuff going between the 22 minute peak and that 18, 19 minute peak. So we just need to go back and look and see if it's got another increase in molecular ion. And we, sure enough, we see it, it's at 213. We start to see the molecular ion increase in 16 EV on that peak, um, suggesting that it's basically two carbons, four hydrogens away from where we were before, right? So, uh, Basically, uh, Dr. Haglin just had those uh, those NN, what are they, a amines uh, showing up there. Uh, we're finding basically the same thing in airplane dust, I guess you could say, as you're finding in the homes. Uh, as far as compounds present in only bleed air aircraft, well, we found a, a, a number of them. It's very hard to sift through, and they're definitely not um, completely identified now. This is certainly a screening step. We're gonna to have to go back with standards to make sure that we found what we think we found. However, um, we're collecting a huge amount of evidence and the 16 EV stuff is allowing us to throw away a, a huge number of uh, false identifications and leading to potentially better identifications. Like for example, octanol was something that we thought we were seeing in a huge number of samples. 130 on the molecular ion peak for octanol, not showing up at all, um, but 158 is, so maybe decanol, maybe nanoic acid, not, not too sure, but um, at any rate, we know where not to look when we start to do our, our actual targeted screening of this stuff. Sorry. Um, so in conclusion, uh, GCGC time of flight mass spec, utilizing tandem ionization is a very useful screening tool for doing this kind of work. Uh, it really demonstrated its worth in the sense that having all that space really let us get away with having very, very dirty blanks, basically. So it allowed us to get away with stuff that we probably wouldn't have otherwise. Um, while we can't meet any kind of criteria, like, uh, for example, a Shemansky scale, uh, where they're looking at high-res data and they're saying, okay, we have this much confidence um, in, our, in our different kind of assessments using the system, we think that coupling our GCGC data with our, um, like with the tandem ionization, basically allows us to at least get to the point where we could consider the things that we've kind of identified, so to speak, as masses of interest or compounds of interest that we could look at in the future in targeted respect. And the last thing uh, to note from the conclusions is it does appear that, um, at least superficially, it appears that um, there are more compounds present in bleed air pressurized aircraft than there are in uh, non-bleed air pressurized aircraft. 
Um, so it's something to continue to look at. Maybe we'll find out uh, something new about it in the near future. Okay. Uh, Lastly, I'd just like to say thank you to some people. I'd really like to say thank you to my supervisory team. So Dr. Gwen O'Sullivan, who is just over there, uh, David Megson, Aidan Doyle in Manchester Metropolitan, uh, fellow, lab member, fellow lab members, sorry, at the Environmental Forensics and Arson Lab. So we have Emily Carroll, Caleb Marks, and James Walker, and John and Scott at Spectral Works for all their assistance with working through this data. Um, thank you very much for your attention.